Thank you guys for coming. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I went around and I talked to a few people in the crowd before this, and uh, I asked the same question to everybody, among other things, do you believe in quality or quantity? It was kind of a trick question, and people mostly said quality. I kind of tend to agree. However, Colin said, why not both? Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Why not both? So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, the title of my talk is Create Ugly, and what I want to do is I want to make this ridiculous debate in our industry, quality versus quantity, completely and totally meaningless, pointless. Get it out of there. So I'm Italian. It's very obvious to many people. Gel, hands, a lot of that. <laughs> this will become a very common theme throughout this session. So just buckle up for that. So because I'm Italian, there are two things in the world that are more important to me than literally anything, family and food. And at the intersection of those two things is one dish that every Italian-American household cherishes. It's the most sacred thing. The overlap of family and food in an Italian household is one special dish. Can anyone guess what that is? The sauce. Someone said it. The sauce. The sauce. It is the most special thing. My mom makes the best sauce on earth. If you don't believe me, meet me outside. We'll have a debate, and it will, I will not stop until you just get tired. My mom makes the best sauce on the planet. And every Italian would tell you that it's their mom. It's really my mom. So I remember in college, I, uh, I lived in this off-campus apartment. I had a bunch of roommates, about six at the time. And every time my mom came to visit, she'd bring a cooler of food. And in that food, among other things, was the sauce. She'd bring like frozen containers of the sauce for us to eat. It was awesome. My roommates would creep up the stairs behind my mom because they knew there was some food in that cooler. And they were going to like kind of steal it from me, or we were going to share it. And uh, one weekend, I went away visiting some friends off campus. And I turned to my roommate that shared the same floor as me, and I said, Tim, I'm going to be gone for the weekend. There's some sauce left in the fridge. Why don't you go ahead and finish it? And I left. When I came back, I noticed that there was a pan on the stove, and it had some like red, crusty stuff around the edges. And I was like, oh, great, Tim finished it. And I looked inside, and at the bottom, there was this like orange, gloppy, gooey, like alien substance like caked around the bottom. And I said, Tim, did you, did you do something to my mom's sauce? And he goes, oh yeah, like I needed more of it. And so I just melted in some Velveeta cheese. <laughs> <laughs> they never did find Tim's body. <laughs> but my point is in anything human beings do, marketing, otherwise, cooking, we all want more stuff, right? And what we want to do to get more stuff is we want to take shortcuts. Now, some shortcuts are fine. They're good. They land you in a better place. Most shortcuts, most hacks are bad. Tim's was bad. <laughs> Don't be like Tim, OK? But what I want to talk about today are the few people in the world that are able to do these things, quality and quantity, a lot, right? They say this is something quality, sauce or otherwise, content. And they can do it in high volumes, right? They don't have this weird debate that we make out in our industry to be a conflict. Um, you, you heard a little background on me, so I'll just skip through the bio. But if you want to hear some more of my Italian-ness come through in my writing, just go to sorryformarketing.com. That's my personal blog. I have a treat for you at the end that links to that blog. Um, and what I want to talk about today are, again, those people that make this debate completely meaningless. And they do exist. And I've been studying them for a few years now. And, and I'm, I'm hoping to inspire you to start behaving like them. There's a lot of knowledge around creating content. And it's really hard to condense it into a 40-minute talk. So if nothing else, I just want to get you guys heading down the right path. And then afterwards, we can talk tactics and tools and things like that. So I want to start with a little game. Hopefully, you'll participate here. Let's do, do a game of opposites. Uh, what is the opposite of up? Just shout it out. Yeah. Down. Great. What is the opposite of in? Out. No trick questions here. What is the opposite of a working clicker? <laughs> what is the opposite of hot? Cold. What is the opposite of quality? It's not quantity. Crap, yes. Yes, absolutely. Someone said crap. Thank, who said that, by the way? Thank you. Uh, it's not quantity. I was an English lit major, and we learned about words, and I'm pretty sure I never learned that the opposite of quality is quantity. And there are people in the world that if you ask quality or quantity, they just say, that's not a thing. Like, it's not. But I understand why we make it out to be. I do. Um, when you create a few things, you can probably do them really well, right? You're doing one thing really well. If you're in the session before with John Lee Dumas, he's great as a podcaster. He does it insanely well, right? 
We have entrepreneurs in the NextView portfolio that have one product, they're focused on one problem, and we advise that they do that because we think that's the way to do something really, really well. And as you start to do more things, the quality will decline. And I think through technology and process and tactics and all this modern stuff we buzz about in these conferences, you can delay a steep drop off, right? So it's a power law, but it's not quite all the way to the bottom, and that's the little plateau you see there. But no matter how much technology you bolt onto your process, no matter how many consultants you bring in, no matter how much time you spend laboring over like, well, our blog's not being read, not because the writing sucks, but it's the SEO and it's all these other things, no matter how much you do that stuff, eventually you still reach this point where the quality just goes through the floor. And I call that moment the crapping point. <laughs> we all reach it at some point. We're being asked to create more stuff. There's more channels. There's more customers to reach. There's more demands from clients, from bosses, from teammates. It's insane. And this idea of quality versus quantity has to stop. So my goal for you is to, today and in the future, laugh in the face of that question. If you talk to a journalist, they have friends in tech media, they have to write multiple blog posts, articles. They don't call it content. They call it stories, articles. They have to write multiple pieces a day and work on longer form, bigger pieces like features and profiles of people all throughout the week, and meet an insanely high quality bar set by the editorial team. So when I say quality versus quantity to them, they're just like, again, uh, both, because it's not a thing. I get fired if I say either or. And so my obsession is this idea of prolific creators. How can we all become prolific creators? You know, and what is it to be prolific in the first place? I think the answer might be a little surprising and a little counterculture to some people in, in the marketing world. I think being prolific is none of these things. It's not creating more stuff. It's not like finishing our work faster, hacking it. And it's also not tapping into some almighty, unspoken panacea of the internet, right? The growth hacking movement, while well-intentioned, I think has spawned this search for some law, some hack, some silver bullet that we want to tap into, and all our problems will be solved, right? I don't buy it. What being prolific is about is it, it's about this. How can we give our audiences what they want quicker, more frequently, more often, and, and be, better, be, with better grammar, <laughs> higher quality? How can we do all that stuff? And what they want, we should zoom in on that word, is not more stuff. They don't want to say how brilliant this blogger is for hacking that article and writing it quicker and delivering me something slightly less than if they spent more time on the craft. That's what this is about, craft. They want quality and a lot of it. They want both. So I want to talk about today, how do you actually take the top and move it out? Right? How can you do more things really, really well, and how can you avoid the crapping point for longer? How do you push that point where it all goes to hell further out? Right? And some of that's technology, and some of that's tactics and process, and a lot of it is frame of mind and how you structure your day and operate. So what I want to do is go over some data that I acquired with the community group that I run in Boston, and then go into the five things that all prolific creators share and how you can adapt that to your work. So I did this article uh, last year. I, uh, you heard my bio, I run Boston Content, which is a community group in, in the Boston area, New England area. We have 1,200 members, and I polled those members on their creative skills, their ability to put out the work, and their career paths. And some of the data was eye-opening and troubling, to say the least. So uh, first I asked, how did you get into this field? Maybe, you know, I thought maybe if we all came from the same background, we could speak the same language. Uh, no. 23% of our members are ex-journalists, 28% are ex-traditional marketers, 43% came from this other category that I had in the survey. Archaeology, teaching, law, construction, and the list goes on. So quick show of hands, how many of you are not from media and not from other marketing channels but started doing content marketing from the other bucket? That's a lot of hands. And what this has created to me is this awesome compendium of knowledge of like all these really interesting diverse backgrounds coming to our industry and attacking problems in new and exciting ways. We should harness that and study it and learn from it. And so I continued the survey and I really drilled into how do you create your content? How do you produce the media? And, and how often? And, and here's what they said. 90% of our members create every single week. They're, they're publishing, writing, or they're, they're going through the process of creating something at least once a week. And 63% create daily. How many people here say that they are working on a piece to be published later every single day? Show of hands, daily. Keep your hands up. Everybody look around. How many, that's a ton of hands. 
This is worrisome to me, and I'll get into why. 78% said they were passionate about marketing. 97% passionate about creating the content. The creation part is why they landed in here. They told me I could create stuff, and I showed up for work. That's how I get into this, guys. And then I asked them, interesting, so you're so in love with creating, and you do it yourself, and you do it often, so are you satisfied with your abilities to create content? There's a lot of trainings for marketers, training for salespeople, training for everything in business. Are you satisfied with your skills when it comes to creating the content? And here is the answer I got. <laughs> this answer is incredibly troublesome to me, because if you notice that big no at the end, them screaming at me, no, I am not satisfied. 100% of them said, 100%, with 1,200 members said, it is critical to my company, my job, and or my career that I improve my ability as an individual to create great content. Not to outsource it, although that's helpful. I love paying freelancers because they care about their craft. I love it. But my members are saying, we want to improve our abilities to create content, maybe to do it ourselves, maybe to work better with our freelancers and our agencies, but I need to do it. Bar none, everyone said, yes, I need to do it. And when it comes to like this topic, the production part of our jobs, the industry is bizarrely mum. And I've talked offline and over drinks all week long about this topic. When we think about our content marketing industry, most of the advice is like, you know what the secret to great content or to great marketing today is? Just create great content. And here's how to market it. And here's how to distribute it. And here's how to analyze it. And it's like, hold on. That part is hard, right? How do you create great content? What does it take? What's the mentality? What's the process? Do you have the skills? Can we train them? Do we have to hire for them? It's a huge problem. And the more I talk to people in the industry, the more people are starting to move away from taking other roles like marketing and slamming it against a blog or a podcast, because that doesn't work. And they're on the hunt for writers and producers who intrinsically want to create and can that can learn the marketing part. I always say, give me a writer that I can teach marketing any day, because I can't necessarily teach a marketer that can't write to write. It takes too long. It's too difficult. So I want to start talking about this today. It's time that we stop doing this weird thing where it's like, just create great content, everyone can do it, and then market it, and then, no, we have to stop. So here are five things, this obsession of mine that I've been talking about and thinking about and writing about, this obsession of mine has led me to five realizations, five things that prolific creators do insanely well. The first, and John, I was so happy to hear your acronym of success because the S is very similar. You said start, the first thing. Number one, every prolific creator has an extreme bias to act. You can't hold them back, they just wanna go. Just get out there and create stuff and dive in and do stuff. Every prolific creator has an extreme bias to act. Here is how not to be a prolific creator, and rather than throw any of my wonderful friends in the industry under the bus, this example involves me. This was on my plate a while ago. I had to finish designing an ebook, and I had written all the content. I had designed kind of the layout of the body and the ending. I needed to design the cover, and then I could ship it. So that was on my to-do list. So I decided, well, it's about content marketing, so let me go to Google Images and search for pencil icons, right? Writing, it's about writing and blogging. I'll find a pencil icon, put it on my cover. So I search Google Images, I find these pencil icons, I pick this one, I really like it. And what I realized is the reason I like it is the notepad right, because it's kind of more evocative of content. So there's a lot of stuff there, it's paper, cool. Notepads would be a better icon for my ebook cover. So I went back to Google Images, searched for notepad icons. Then what I found is just all these notepad icons, right? There's blue ones, and there's like PNGs, and all these other versions, and whatever the N++ is, I don't even know, and I could spend a year just trying to figure that out. Nope, I have work to do, I have to produce content. And so I thought, okay, well I really like the black one. So let me click on the black one, I'm all set, I'm gonna grab it, right click, save image. There are more? There's more. So I went, let, let me click more. There's more like the one I like. What if I'm missing the best one, right? It's out there somewhere, I gotta find it. So, um, okay, I'm searching all these. But wait, like, is this even the right way to design an ebook cover? I'm not a designer. I started as a sports journalist and got into marketing. I love to write, not design. How do you design an ebook cover? Um, well, maybe, uh, let me go find some examples, ebook cover examples. There's tons of them out there. It's awesome. It's so great. You know, you can just easily find them, right? And here are the first three results. I'm like, first one, nah, second one, nah. Third one, ah, Pinterest is great for inspiration. Why? I had a wedding a few years ago. It was great for our inspiration. I'm designing our new room in our apartment now. Great for inspiration, great for visual inspiration. I'll go to Pinterest. Yes, perfect. Getting work done. I'm acting. So I found all these great ebook cover examples, and I'm like, yeah, let me start pinning them to this board, and I'll create an amalgam of all the, the greatest examples. And then I realized, wait, the Pinterest login was my wife's, not mine, so I have to create a Pinterest account, so I create a Pinterest account. <laughs> and, then, 
And then I have this board of like examples that inspire me that I kind of like, and I realize there's like 20 of them, and I have no idea like which ones of these are even good, right? Like I don't know who created this stuff. And I remember, oh wait, I just searched for examples. Well, Google just told me there's this search. Let me go down that path. And the whole time I've done jack squats. I've acted, I haven't created a thing. I haven't finished my project and it's frustrating. This is not how to become a prolific creator, guys. So I love this quote by Aziz Ansari. He says, have you ever, this is a joke that he does, a little bit. Have you ever met someone with no teeth? And you asked, hey, what happened? And they said, bought the wrong toothbrush. Should have done more research. <laughs> no, just pick one. Just pick the first icon and finish my cover. That's all I need to do. And he says the notion of being paralyzed by all this technology is supposed to make us more productive, efficient, and connected. It's, it's fascinating to me. It's horrifying to me. This is what we do too often. We say, what is the best practice for this? What is the process for this? What is the right approach? How do we put infrastructure in place? How do we build out and buy the tools? We tow the water. We say, we're going to create this. We're going to build a great podcast, great blog, whatever the asset is, and we tow the water. What do prolific creators do? This. They just freaking do it. And guess what? It's going to hurt the first few times you do that. Trust me, it will. But you have to keep taking that leap. You have to. Prolific creators prefer imperfect action to perfect process and practice. In other words, they create ugly. I don't know the best way to design an ebook cover. Hell, I don't really know Photoshop. I can do something in PowerPoint. I'm OK. And the more I try it, the more I do it, the more I just take the leap, the better I get. Right? And on the way, instead of finding the, the perfect process up front and then producing the work, you start the other way. Produce the work and find the perfect process as you go. I work with startups all the time. They're great at this. Prolific creators will create ugly to find the beautiful way to create eventually. So this topic of shortcuts and hacks that we're all maybe here for, here's what a great prolific creator does. They see that, oh my gosh, to get to this beautiful outcome, it's this meandering, difficult path, and I can find a better way. I'm a prolific creator. I can take that shortcut. I can de design it in PowerPoint in five minutes versus trying to learn a new tool like Photoshop, for example. All my designer friends are just totally hating on me right now. If I, that's, I'll get into that in a sec. This is what a prolific creator does. That is a shortcut or a hack to a prolific creator. It gets you to the same quality outcome as doing it the right way. That's what a shortcut is for. What we do too much in marketing is this. We find a shorter way, but it doesn't really get you the same outcome <laughs> at all. <laughs> Some shortcuts are bad. Tim's was bad. <clears throat> so how to be prolific, number one, dive in. Just start, guys, just start. Create ugly. And if you need some tools to help you, here's some I'd recommend. MakerBook is a big directory of tools, not to do marketing of content, but the production of content. Canva is one of my favorites. I'm not a designer. I can fake it till I make it, but this helps me fake it way better. And then uh, Unsplash is that icon there. Unsplash is a free repository of uh, high-res photos. You can do whatever you want with it, no restrictions. Great. And those two and others are linked at MakerBook. OK, the second thing. All prolific creators work out their creative muscles. They go to the creative gym. They get better and stronger. I love the internet. I really do. <laughs> Question for you guys. What is the single best way to improve any creative skill? Just do it. Yes, yeah, side projects. Side projects are awesome. Um, how many people here have some kind of side project that they're working on? It has maybe nothing to do with your job. Maybe it does. Yes, awesome. All those hands should go up eventually. But a lot of people seem to be interested in doing side projects. Side projects should be stupid. They should be silly. They should be random. They could be related to your work. Google's famous for the 20% time and that, born, that, that birthed Gmail and other big products like that. But it was about a couple things. Side projects help you work out on new creative muscles, new skills that your job isn't affording you. It helps you find new ways of inspiring yourself to do more work when you do your day job. Sometimes you find new things that plug directly in. Sometimes it's a little meandering in your head, like John Cleese was talking about. But it makes you stronger, makes you better. This is uh, tennis star Rafael Nadal. Anybody know what's a little bit weird and interesting about Nadal's muscles? Have you guys ever heard this story? He's a lefty. So a lot of his swings come from the left side and left hand. And as a result of doing that over and over and over and over, his left arm is actually bigger than his right arm. True story. And in content marketing, the pace of the internet and the pace of our jobs, we can't be like that. We can't do that one thing forever. Eventually, we have to work out 
more muscles and be more well-rounded. We have these side projects that could help us. It's so easy to launch a blog or do a podcast or an ebook just for fun. You know, a few minutes a day, a few minutes a week is all it takes. Remember there was someone who was trying to apply back when I worked for HubSpot, they were trying to apply to our content team and the, the core of the work would be creating ebooks. And she said, well, I've been in marketing for five years, I've never created an ebook. You know, I'm hoping you'll give me that shot. And I'm like, why, why haven't you? What is, literally nothing is stopping you, right? Try it. Just, do, it doesn't matter if it fails. It's the process that matters. Here's a great example of someone who does side projects that make him the most prolific creator I've ever come across. His name is Eric Devaney. Say hi to him on Twitter. He's a friend of mine. I've hired him in two different jobs. I hired him, I would hire him 100 more times. He works for HubSpot right now. He, on his personal blog, will do little doodles just at home and he'll just publish them. He will go on trips and take photos and try to you know, doctor them up a little bit afterwards on his computer. He is learning design. He never knew how to do Photoshop. This is one of my favorites he's done. Ice bucket challenge alternatives. My favorite is the mice bucket challenge. <laughs> he will carve uh, from like wood sculptures little gifts for people. And you know, it lets your mind wander. If you guys were at the John Cleese talk, it lets your mind enter that like tortoise mind phase where your subconscious is just kind of focused in, on play, right? Great things happen. He's one of the most prolific creators in his day job for HubSpot. And a lot of it has to do with these side projects. For me, I've been writing sports blogs and other side blogs as long as I can remember. This was the first one I designed on Blogger, and it was ugly as hell. It was like 2008. The next one was a little bit better. I moved to Boston as a Yankee fan, so I wrote Cranky Yankee Fan, what it's like being a Yankee fan in Boston. And the design is like a little bit better. I'm trying some effects. It's not very clean and stuff like that. And you can kind of see my improvements in my current blog, Sorry for Marketing. And all of that designed in PowerPoint, right? <laughs> I used to have so many designer friends. No more. I'm there, Tim. So I love this quote, Scott Adams, founder of Dilbert, creator of Dilbert. Creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. Oh my God, we have to do this more in marketing. And art is knowing which to keep. That's the beauty of side projects. I love, love, love this quote. Number two thing to be prolific, create side projects. And if you need some tools, figure out where your mind and your intelligence matches your passion and just do that. For me, it's always been sports. Find something completely unrelated to your job and just hack it. And if you need a way to like string up blogs and other social profiles for that side project, there's a great tool called Namecheck. You type in what the URL or the name is and it tells you what services are still available in this crazy saturated digital world for like xyz.com. Okay, the number three thing that all prolific creators do is they have an intrinsic desire to create. They just want to do stuff. They're just wired that way, I think. But I think we can also improve all of our abilities to act like that. They have an intrinsic desire to create. In other words, it's not just like, today I'm deciding that I am a creative person. It's not how it works. I wanna give you guys a term from uh, game theory. I worked at a startup that used a lot of game mechanics. I had to learn that field a little bit. Um, think of eating a bowl of ice cream. Why do you eat a bowl of ice cream? Is it so that you end up with an empty bowl? No, it's because you enjoy the process of eating it. You're not gonna go to a friend and be like, dude, can you eat this ice cream for me? I just really want like a messy bowl, please. <laughs> just like, you do the process and I'll have the outcome. Please, no, you enjoy eating ice cream. What about sweeping your floor? It's actually done for the clean floor, right? No one is like at home thinking like, okay, five minutes, I just gotta work on my action here. This is, I just gotta improve. You know, how are my legs, how's my stance? No, that's not what you think. You think I need a freaking clean floor. I'd rather blink my eyes than sweep it, hire someone to do it, outsource it, whatever. The difference in these two activities is rooted in the psychology of how all of us attack problems and attack processes and attack projects. In the game theory world, it's called telic. Telic is something that's done for the end result alone. In other words, it's a chore. Marketers have made content creation telic, and that's a huge problem. Because what do we do? Give me the shortcut, get me to the end. Hit publish more, quantity, quantity, quantity. Results, results, leads, leads. We forget there's a craft and a process that we can learn from to get better results, right? If we just take on that a little bit of debt, just that little bit of pause. Right? It doesn't have to be something where you just agonize in a room. You can just dive in and do it, but you have to study it. There's a few ways that you can make a chore turn into something worth doing intrinsically. We can all act like people who are intrinsically motivated to create. There are three ways. Celebrate small creative victories, study content for its own sake, and reward risk and experimentation. Let me give you a few examples. How often do you hear this? That blog post kills it for us. My God. How many views does it get? That's amazing. Good job on that blog post. So many views, so many leads. Right. 
Once in a while, that person who wrote that needs to hear, I really love how you opened that article. That intro paragraph got me here. That was great. Do more of that, right? Get a little burst of dopamine in your brain. You think, oh, that's an achievement I've unlocked. It's like a drug. I want more of that. I will write better. I will study that intro paragraph and how to do it. Anybody here heard of a nut graph? A couple people? Journalists know this. It's like the who, what, where, when, why paragraph. It's kind of somewhere in the beginning of your articles, right? They understand like, oh, I need to manufacture some things in my articles, right? And someone somewhere told them this is what a nut graph is, right? Because they pointed out and celebrated those small creative risks. I love how you did this little call out box in that huge lengthy document. You helped readers just skim it with this beautifully designed call out box with the lessons learned. Awesome, good job, do that again. We didn't talk about the leads yet, we'll get there, but reward and celebrate these little creative victories because people will do it more on your team, with your peers, Study content for its own sake, the best meetings I've ever had and or led. I called them content review sessions. And all we do, we used to do this at a startup I worked for. We'd get a couple beers at the end of the week and we'd all sit in a room and either one of our projects or a third party's project that we came across during the week, we just put it on the board and we'd poke at it. We'd be like, I love this, I'm not sure about that. Like, could we incorporate that back in our own? You know, I call these content x-rays. You kind of put a lens over it and study it and turn it over and figure out well, what was great about it. Why did I like it? Why did I not like it? What parts were good? What parts were bad? And you are, you, you'd be amazed at how many things you learn coming out of that meeting. Schedule, it's 20 minutes a month, 20 minutes a week. It's worth doing. And then reward risks and experiments. I know cultures uh, of organizations kind of prevent this sometimes. But if you can, if you, if you can either manage change in your organization or you work in an organization that rewards this kind of stuff, good things happen when people take risks because they feel safe in doing so. So at the startup I keep mentioning, it was called Daily Break Media. Uh, we used to joke as a startup that this little gremlin was running around breaking our product because it's a startup, right? The product doesn't always work. So I was like, well, we can steer into that. Let's use it. So I put this token together. Everybody got two a month. And in our editorial meetings, you'd have to submit to every person by the end of the month and say, like, all right, I, I have no idea if this is going to work. I'm going to try this. And some of the best, most widely read pieces we ever created were from those ideas. Some of them tanked miserably, but that person felt like they learned new skills and they tried new things. It's like side projects plugged into the corporate world almost. Love this quote from last year's keynote from Kevin Spacey. The device and the length are irrelevant to the story. Start by asking, start by asking what story you want to tell rather than what results you want to see. In other words, make it not telic. The opposite is paratelic, and the rest will follow. My least favorite question, the question in this industry that makes me want to throw this podium the most, how many words should my blog post be? God, a blog is just a container. What are you saying? I mean, here's a giant list of reasons I can't give you that one answer, right? And no writer. What you're saying when you ask that question is, I'm really looking for a shortcut out of this. I got to go home. I got, you know, the dog to feed and walk. Like, how many words do you want? I'll just fuck it, right? That's really what I hear. <laughs> when I hear, how many words should my blog post be? I hear, I do this job, but... Fuck it. <laughs> Please stop asking that question. How to be prolific. Number three, find joy in the process. Study it, turn it over. And really, the tool to do this, it's leadership from you, from your actual leader of your team that's like anointed as the manager, director, VP, CMO, whatever. If you need some tools, build a Twitter list of really creative examples of you know, people that constantly share interesting things, right? Uh, you can use the little token thing. Steal that if you want. Feedly. Flipboard, places where you can put awesome creators into one feed to poke at and share with your team and inspire them. The fourth thing out of five that all prolific creators do really, really well is they can take one idea and generate a ton to sustain their output. It's remarkable. We're both Jays. Yeah, Jay Zo on Twitter. Anyways. Enough about my rap complex. Um, what we all need is an idea pipeline. Because every time you stare at a blinking cursor and start from scratch, it's really hard to do your job well as a content producer. So an idea pipeline is basically all it is. It's some kind of app that syncs on mobile and desktop. That's it. Because in the moment, if you have an idea, a data point, an article that was sent to you, a half-baked paragraph, you know, something that you want to create, just save it right then and there. Catch that moment of inspiration and put it somewhere. Really, really good idea pipelines tend to break out into two halves. You have the one-off stuff, and maybe it's categorized by topic or other things, maybe not, but it's just like this is one piece that I could possibly create. Maybe it's multimedia eventually, but right now I think it's just a blog post, right? The other half is something I call the well, because you can dip into it time and time again. 
The well contains things like mini content brands and series and templates, that kind of thing. So Rand Fishkin of Moz, he's got the Whiteboard Fridays. That's a, like a series or a, a mini content brand. That's like the well, right? They know predictably they could do that. At HubSpot, we like to do marketing in 100 words or less. So it was like a topic that was really hard for marketers, and we just linked to lots of resources in 100 words or less on a Saturday. Uh, at NextView, I am an operator, not a, an investor, but I found my way into VC, so I write a column called Accidental VC. I'm sitting among all these investors talking about how startups should build themselves, and they're just throwing out all this awesome wisdom, and I'm like, this would be great if we wrote about it, right? So I know with certainty that I have ideas I can dip into. If I'm tired, if I'm stressed, if I'm pulled in too many directions, if I'm hung over at a conference, I know who you are, you can just write this stuff, right? You can create it. You can actually be prolific. Uh, if you want actually like a, a visual of what some good idea pipelines look like, I wrote an article recently on my personal blog showing you screenshots of how we organized it at HubSpot, how we did it at a startup I was at, how I do it personally, and go to that bit.ly link. Um, here's another way to hack it. Really prolific creators, all they kind of start with is taking one idea and they just dance around it. They just change little things about it and you just have all this stuff. Um, and, and those levers that you kind of pull are these, a topic, the level of your audience, the format, what kind of like packaging is it? And then the structure, you know, how are you then arranging the information? So let's say, for example, that you want to write about podcasting for business, and you were talking to an introductory level audience, you were gonna write a blog post, it's text format, and it's gonna be a how-to, right? Easy to generate ideas around that because you're kind of framing your reference, you're putting yourself in a smaller box and you can think. Okay, so it's gonna be the intro to podcasting for business. That's one example that could come out of this. If I need more examples, I can just start kicking around these different levers. Well, let's make it into a deck. So now nothing changes except the format. That's another thing. I'm being a little bit more prolific. We can change that to a list or an interview or news on the industry or an op-ed. We can just keep moving that stuff around. Uh, if you guys have subscribed to Sorry for Marketing, uh, I'm gonna put that on there so you guys can download it later. So. Number four, how to be prolific, turn one good idea into many, many more. Find a good idea, not an idea, a good idea, and create lots of stuff around it. Atomization is another term for it. Trello is great for idea pipelines. Evernote is great for idea pipelines. I mentioned on Sorry for Marketing, I'm gonna put that little key if you guys are interested in downloading it. Number five, prolific content creators leave their industry echo chambers. They get out. Here's an example of people who are not leaving the industry echo chamber of marketing. How do I get more Twitter followers? Good Lord, is this boring. How many different things can you write the same way across the industry, right? These people have reached this point, <laughs> right? Sorry, mom. They said, fuck it, don't do that. They reached this point where they just said, okay, well, what are you doing over there? I'm just constantly reading marketing blogs and, and they seem to be writing lists over there about how to get more Twitter followers. We'll do it over here. You know what it's like? It's like applying to a job and it's the same boilerplate cover letter and the only way to be different is you say, hey, sir or madam, I'm very interested in this job. Well, I really, really want it. Sir or madam, I am an extremely interested candidate for this job, right? Like it's not really creativity. You're just kind of marginally changing what people are doing because that's all you're consuming. It's all your career services center taught you to do. That's all the marketing world seems to be doing. Creativity is just connecting things. That's all it is. I wanna read you the rest of this quote. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little bit guilty because they didn't really do it. Here's the eye-opening moment for me. They just saw something and it seemed obvious to them after a while, and that's because they're able to connect experiences that they've had to synthesize new things. If all you're doing is this in your consumption behavior, Guess what you're gonna write, right? And who's gonna remember you? Who's gonna read you? Who's gonna subscribe, buy, share? If you're reading some of that stuff, if you're going for a walk, if you're going to a cooking class, if you're reading something from a sales organization, something in consumer and sports, and you're listening to podcasts and you're reading, if you're, if you're having like a fulfilling life, essentially, if you get out of the echo chamber, I don't know what you're gonna create, but it's gonna be unique, it's gonna be different. I can give the same headline to all of you and I will get zero identical blog posts, why? Because it's, and I could even give you the draft and say edit it and make it better. It'll be all different, all unique, because it's coming through who you are, it's coming through you, right? Your experience of the world. So, number five, prolific creators will find inspiration in many, many diverse places. There's some obvious ones, 
Sometimes they end up poor. Nobody really wants to read what the Muppet movie can teach you about marketing, unless you do it well. I'd read that. You know, so don't just do that. It's not just like, this thing is unrelated, and let's apply it over here. No, it's about synthesizing new ideas together in harmonious ways. Some tools. <laughs> just leave. There's no, like, stop reading, turn off the Feedly list of all marketing blogs, turn off Twitter, go outside, stop thinking about and talking about listicles, right? Just get out, just go do stuff. You'll be a better creator. All prolific creators do this really well. Travel is a big one. Everyone I know that's a great, great writer travels a lot. So how to be prolific? These five things. However, I think there's actually a sixth, and this is what I want to end on. I want to end on this. I want to go, I want to go back to something. I want to end on this. No, not that. Never that. <laughs> this. My favorite movie, I'm a sucker for Pixar, I'm a sucker for food, I mentioned Italian, you guys have noticed this a little bit. How many people have seen Ratatouille? Yes. So, one of my favorite moments in this movie, my wife and I watch it ad nauseum, is when they say, anyone can cook. Anyone can cook, yes, I love it, anyone can cook. And I've heard that recently, and then I'm like, wait, 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 hold on, anyone can cook. But do you wanna eat it? Right? If anyone can cook, if anyone can create content, will they actually want to consume it? The barrier to entry to be creative is so damn low today. And I want to live in a world where creativity is democratized. Or democratized. It's not um, something of the few. It's not bottled up in one person in your industry. It's not bottled up into the person that went to the art school and learned how to be a beautiful literature-based writer. I love that technology exists where literally at home, doing nothing else for five minutes, you can put a blog post out into the world. Like if you guys go back to, I used to write for print publications. It was really hard to get myself published ever in a print publication. We think about how hard it is to get into the big dogs now, but it was hard to just get anything out into the world then, right? And that's way down here, and I love that. But we now need to start thinking about what we're doing and whether people are gonna wanna eat it, consume it, right? Is what we're putting out the door any good? I like to say that for a while, content marketers could just be, and now we actually have to be good. <laughs> Hopefully we were always like that. Nobody in this room was ever doing the black hat stuff, I'm sure, but I think we need to be better at the quality part, not at the expense of quantity, but to harmonize with it. So the number six thing, the thing that really is the umbrella over all of this is something you guys heard a lot this conference from this man right here, John Cleese. Creativity is actually not a talent. It can be something of the many. It's a way of operating. You can figure out a way of operating regardless of your creative talent, right? Sure, some people might be wired to lean that way a little bit, right? I care about the C word in content marketing more than the M word, I always have. But it's a way of operating. All the stuff I just gave you matters not at all, unless you think about it as the way you structure your day, the process, how you're going about your life. It's not something where you can schedule it an hour down the road, right? John Cleese talks about that open mind, closed mind, hair, brain, tortoise mind, right? It's, it's about vacillating between being very open to ideas and being very critical of them. And what he's referencing is how he operates. It's how he structures his day and lives his life. It's not a tool, it's not a shortcut, it's not a hack. <clears throat> Let's end on one more game. I love, I love games. What is the opposite of or? And. 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 Come on, what is the opposite of or? And. Yes, so this choice that you are hearing all over our industry is no choice at all. And the only choice we have is what we're going to do about it. And I hope you'll start doing something about it. So thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate your time. We do, I do have a gift for you all. There's a, a lot of tools and other thank stuff you. listed there, yeah. Yep, bit.ly, oh thank God. So questions? I love that there are so many of you. We've gotta have some great questions from the field, I'm sure. I'll also hang out afterwards if you feel more comfortable doing one-to-one -one stuff. Yep. I know I have some. So what's ugly? Tell huh. me what's ugly. Uh, that's why I do a podcast, because I have a face made for radio. That's one example. Um, so this idea of, of creating ugly, 
all the people I've been privileged to work with that create a lot of stuff at a high quality, they weren't formally trained. And really that's what I was getting at with like this background that we have that's all very diverse. We're not all coming from design school. We're not all coming from uh, being literature majors or, or being in media and having to do two to three articles a day for years of our life. The folks that do come from those backgrounds have an unfair advantage, but they're also not the majority of our industry. And so the idea of like creating ugly is just jump in, just start doing it and figuring it out. I don't know how many times I've been in, in a meeting, either consulting or practicing, where it's about finding the right process, what is the best practice, all the research, buying the tools, and it just delays you doing stuff, right? And that's actually the best way to learn, is just get your hands dirty, do stuff. And if you're scared to do it for work, do it through side projects, but this idea of like you have to have this like unlocked perfect way of doing things, because if you think about marketing, we love to idolize like this is the funnel, this is the practice, this is like top of funnel, middle funnel, bottom funnel, and all the things that apply, because we, we think too much about this clean, neat process. And, and I don't think that's actually how to be prolific. I think it's about we have this goal, we have this problem, and we're just going to start attacking it, and we're going to clean up our process and get better and get more efficient as we go. Right? So it's a little bit of the telic versus non-telic activity there. Great, and I see people leaving. Please make sure you turn in your surveys. I do have a question here, Jay. Okay. Okay, so how do you adjust your content for different channels such as podcasts, you know, social media, articles, things like that? Yeah, yeah, so the question's around like multi-channel. This is the topic here. How do you adjust something, maybe let's say it's something that's working for other things. Um, the first thing is to identify through a really quick test what's working. Um, people, I think, like to create stuff and then immediately put it everywhere. I think you need to find where are people spending time with you. So an email list is a great way. Take a segment of that email list and you soft launch things. Or you can do low dollar amounts on Facebook or Google and stuff like that. But you have to find a way to get some sort of qualitative response. You know, like we run a podcast at NextView called Traction. And people used to say nice things about our blog, but they would end those sentences in periods. When they heard our podcast, they were like ending in exclamation points. And we weren't getting a million downloads. You know, we aspire to, but it was a really small subset, but they were saying nice things. And so I was like, okay, they're so passionate about that, what else can we then put that content? So you would take the podcast and put it on a blog as a, as a text article. You kind of go native at all these channels. We would tweet quote graphics and things like that. So I think it's about finding something that works to a small number of people, getting that visceral reaction, and then scaling out your efforts. And then really putting the hammer down on all the distribution and all the other channels. And the good news is you can do this in a really lean fashion. Right? It's about testing and iterating. I come from the startup world, so that's kind of what startups are all about. But I think large corporations can mimic this, and they almost have an unfair advantage, because they already have reach, that they can just test a sliver of that reach against one idea or one topic. Thanks for the question. Great. Thanks so much. It's criminal of me, criminal of me to stop us. But Jay has promised that he's going to hang out after. And we, I misspoke earlier. We do have a lunch and learn after this in this room. So I do need to clear us all out. Please take your completed survey to the door or to Jay, and he'll make a few notes on it for himself. <laughs> I took John's joke. It's John Dema Lee Dumas's joke for sure.